come to the end of this special se session and the and today's uh, proceedings until the next year. Over the last two months, we have been occupied primarily with our efforts to complete our work on the 2020 appropriation bill in time to ensure the budget becomes law before the end of the year. We have worked with the federal government, ministries, departments, and agencies to set priorities. We reached out to stakeholders and citizens groups. We liaised with constituencies or with constituents to understand their expectations and reflect their expectations, those expectations in our consideration of the appropriation bill. I am glad to report that these efforts have been worthwhile and today we have passed the budget in the House of Representatives in good time to maintain the January to December budget cycle in line with the commitments we made when we resumed office. The January to order. December budget cycle please, order, honorable members, please. is necessary to ensure please. effective implementation of our annual budgets to meet order, our please. nation's development challenges. By our joint efforts and the grace of God, we will maintain this standard for every year we are in office and leave a legacy for our successors to aspire to. When we resumed in January of this year, the coronavirus was a novel development still confined for the most part to China. We do not know that our economy will be upended in a few months and our lives disrupted by a pandemic we did not anticipate and were not prepared for. We did not foresee a world where citizens will be confined to their homes for months, unable to earn a living, denied the freedom to live full lives in the company of friends and colleagues, family and loved ones. Yet, when the moment came, we did not shrink away from it. Within the limits of our brutal realities, with our options limited by scarcity of resources, by dilapidated infrastructure and outdated laws, we acted to slow the spread of disease to treat the sick, comfort the afflicted, and provide for the most vulnerable in our nations, of our nation's citizens. The truth is, we have done better than many believed was possible. Better than many nations, even the most advanced, our economy has taken a big hit. But through partnership with the private sector, government has been able to prevent the nightmare scenarios that some predicted. Members of the House, together and individually, made financial contributions to support welfare provisions for citizens. There is virtually no constituency in the country that did not feel the impact of efforts by their representatives. I commend you all and I thank you most sincerely. In an unprecedented single day session, we passed the Emergency Economic Stimulus Bill to provide targeted economic relief in response to the emerging threat. We did this because before the coronavirus breached our borders, because we anticipated and sought to prevent the worst possible outcomes. That legislation never became law, but yet the bill's specific objectives have been implemented through executive action to defer mortgages, remove duties on medical imports, provide salary relief, and related financial support for small and medium scale enterprises in the country. Despite an extraordinary torrent of, of misinformation and political mischief, the House moved forward with landmark legislation to reform our nation's obsolete statutory framework for preventing and managing infectious diseases and pandemic, pandemics so that we can be better prepared for the next time. We worked with the executive to address medical doctors and healthcare workers' welfare demands and resolve a labor dispute that would have resolved in strike actions and walkouts with devastating consequences for too many of our citizens amidst the raging and deadly pandemic. Because of the House of Representatives, hazard allowance became part of the medical and pandemic lexicon in this country. The intervention of the House elevated the welfare of health healthcare workers to a ministerial issue and saw, it to, and saw to it that these hazard allowances were provided for and paid. 
We convened a conference of speakers of African parliaments in a broad collaboration to, re to, to renegotiate the terms of our national debt and free up much needed resources for development whilst committing to a new regime of responsible administration of public resources. We recognize that gov governance in a time of uncertainty required us to change the way we conduct legislative business. So we reviewed and updated our legislative agenda to focus on critical priorities. And for the first time, we appointed a committee to drive monitoring and implementation of our agenda. Notwithstanding these efforts, we cannot escape the hard truth that this has been a tough year of suffering for too many citizens, a year like none before. If we learned nothing else, we learned that we have a limited window to address problems that have been a long, that have been long time in the making. This year, we have seen that the structural inadequacies of our economy and healthcare systems, our internal security and justice architecture have left us dangerously exposed to the risk of a complete and irreversible loss of faith in the Nigerian project by a large section of our citizens. Despite spirited government efforts, our economy is still overly reliant on the sale of crude oil. Vast swaths of potential in tourism and agriculture, manufacturing and technology, media and entertainment remain untapped due to insecurity, infrastructural deficits, policy and regulatory inconsistency. The risks we face are not abstract. In the aftermath of, aftermath of the NSAS protests, we saw it in the flames that engulfed our cities. We saw it two weeks ago in Zabamari with the massacre of citizens farming for survival, and most recently in the abduction of young boys seeking to improve their lives through education in Kankara. We commend the efforts of the security agencies who working together have secured the release of the Kankara boys and ensured their safe return to their families. We must recognize the evolving nature of the risks we face from insurgency and banditry and be prepared to adapt our efforts to overcome this danger. The Ninth House of Representatives will continue to address the security challenges that threaten our country. We have initiated and will continue efforts to reform the statutory framework for police accountability through the Police Service Commission Reform Bill, which has passed second reading. We will continue to exercise our constitutional powers of oversight to, de to demand more from the military and security services. Even as we make sure to provide the resources they need to train, equip, and provide for the welfare of their men and women who bear arms on our nation's behalf and in our name. The responsibility of, do of undoing the damage of many years has fallen on us. We have a lot of work to do. We are each called to lead our nation towards the promised land to restore the dignity of every man, woman, and child who swears allegiance to our constitution and salutes our nation's flag. We will improve Nigeria by building infrastructure that provides jobs, by protecting our people's lives and property, and repairing the relationship between citizens and the state. This is what we must do to restore faith in Nigeria's promise and prevent the, ri the risk of a destructive renegotiation of our nationhood. Honorable colleagues, I do not speak to you today from a place of despair. I come to you with an abundance of hope and an unshakable belief in the triumphant spirit of our nation. We are God's people, a country of diverse cultures, united by our incomparable ability to bloom and thrive despite adversity. If we determine not to be consumed by our differences, if we come together in love and strength and faith to seek the common good, it won't be too long before we attain and leave for our children the inheritance of a prosperous nation where peace and justice reign for all. This is the goal to which we must remain committed. I want to, at this time, especially commend once more the health workers, the frontline doctors, nurses, laboratory technicians, care providers, and all those who have every day of this year led the fight against an unseen yet deadly enemy in COVID-19. We recognize their commitment and honor their sacrifice. I pay tribute to the men and women who bear arms in our name, who stand in the gap, risking their lives in our defense. Let us all carry in our hearts the memory of those who have paid the highest price in blood in defense of our constitution and our democracy. May God bless and keep them all forever. I remember also the ones who lost 
the ones we lost this year, our dearly beloved colleagues, friends and family who reached for the heavens and touched the hand of God. We mourn them still, but find comfort in the memory of their lives and the assurance of their peaceful repose. The recent uptick in, pos in positive cases of COVID-19 is a clear and present danger that will only be defeated by strict adherence to the guidelines on masks, social distancing, and personal hygiene. Please take this seriously. We are not out of the woods yet, and we cannot afford to act as if we are. Honorable colleagues, as we go, I wish us well. I wish us a Merry Christmas, and I pray that we will all be reunited in January to continue the people's business. Thank you, and God bless you all.